Got your attention. Good morning and welcome to our church this morning. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am Terry Moore, one of the last Slayer assistants, and I'm normally behind those drum pads. In fact, I will be later on again. So it's going to be watch me run backwards and forwards all morning. But welcome on behalf of Mike, I bid you all a very, very warm welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 201. 201. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Please be stuck. mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you please be seated we say together our prayer of preparation <laughs> Almighty God to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. 
we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We stand for the Gloria. <clears throat> Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us, you are seated at the right hand of the Collect for Sunday the 1st of September. O Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow after us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Would you please sit for the first reading. The epistle is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, which can be found on page 1180 in your church Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if ever, everything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is from your white hymn book, the extra bits for summer. Uh, number five, O Perfect Father. O oh, perfect for the number five in the white pamphlet.
Alleluia, Alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servants, servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed in sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face on to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned with his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, That's it. Yeah. this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Father, I ask that you would take my words that you would make them your words, that you would deliver them to our hearts, and that you would change our lives. Through all of this, draw us closer to you and help us more effectively help each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, this is the last of a three series on prayer. It's kind of a uh, an overview. It's the it's the drone in the sky looking at the big picture uh, of of prayer, not delving deep, but but trying to cover the breadth and the essential nature of what prayer itself is. And we saw Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. On the first one, we saw. Jesus midway as he taught his disciples, as they insisted that he teach them about prayer. And now this week we're going to look at Jesus at the end of his ministry, just before his death. But first, last week I asked you to do a little homework. Uh, not too much, but uh, it was uh, from Ephesians chapter 1. Now, some of you may be able to look that up in your Bibles right now, chapter 1, verse 15 to 23, but I will read it back to you uh, as, as we go, uh, because I, I think it, it kind of makes a bridge between last week and this week. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. 
I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And then he goes on to explain what that power is like, and I'm not going to read the rest of it, but I want to look at that just for a moment uh, and get us thinking about the result of Jesus' modeling and example on prayer through his life is worked out in the life of his disciples, John, James, Peter, etc. And uh, it's uh, worked out in Paul and St. Paul, and he's trying to convey that to the various churches, including the church in Ephesus. And how, if you can have a look there, how does Paul uh, describe his prayer for the Ephesians? When does he pray? How long does he pray? How often does he pray? Not stopping. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers. It's a constant thing, isn't it? He prays, and he prays some more, and he keeps praying, and he prays all the time, in between things. That is a central part of who he is and how he wants to give himself to them. And so that's what the Ephesians uh, are being modeled. We see that in Jesus, of course, uh, because he has been praying for his disciples and for others, but particularly for his disciples right on through his ministry. And we, we see examples of that. And what does he pray for the Ephesian church? There's three things that he highlights there. I, verse 18, uh, sorry, ver, uh, yes, verse 18, I pray that the eyes uh, of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope. So he prays that they will know the hope to which he has called you. The inheritance, he says, uh, in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Hope, inheritance, and power. The, thing that Je the inheritance is the thing that Jesus did on the cross in which they have received. The hope is where they're going to go, and the power is what they have for the present. He wants to know that inside them dwells the knowledge of who they are in Christ the place that they will eventually go to as believers and the power with which they can operate in this world at this time. Past, present, and future. And that's his prayer for them. That in the very core of their being, he saw that the uh, eyes of their heart, they will get this. Okay, so that's last week. Now, this week, let's take a look at the end of Jesus' ministry. The Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has gone through the Last Supper. He's been out with his disciples. They've, they've shared the meal. And there's a sense in Jesus, there's a, not just a sense, Jesus knows that this is all drawing to a close. He has told the disciples that. He's told them what the ultimate outcome will be. And he's told some of the crowds as well, eventually. But now he has the last supper with them and they know 
And he knows that that is the Last Supper. So they all go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is an, an olive grove on the Mount of Olives and where the olive press was. And they sit down to pray, and he realizes that it's been a long day for all of them. And he asks his three favorite disciples to go with him, off to pray semi-privately, if you will, so that they together can help him in what it may be this last time of prayer. And he takes the sons of Zebedee, it tells us, who are James and John, and he takes Peter. Now, these are the three of his closest disciples. They're the ones he felt closest to, that he, uh, John is the beloved disciple, Peter is the rock on which he's going to build his church, uh, and, and James is uh, his most, one of his most uh, effective evangelists, is what is always going out and bringing people in. And these are the three whom he has shared most of his heart with. So he takes them apart. The other thing about these three, just so you know, they're the ones uh, when he said, I am going, he tells them he's going to be crucified, that he will be killed. And at the, at the Last Supper, he said, this, this is a cup, and he went through what we're going to do in a few minutes. Uh, and they said, can we, we will share this with you. They said to him, we will give our lives alongside yours. They are the three who said that. And Jesus says to them earlier on, you, you, you cannot share that same cup, but yes, you will. And that's a puzzle at the time. But the reality is they cannot go up on the cross with him and they cannot be the salvation of the world as he will be. But they will all die similar deaths. And they will die that because they followed him at another time. So they don't understand at that point. But these are the three. He only said about those three. And now he brings them out to pray. couple of things I want you to see in here. One, the three best, most favorite disciples that Jesus handpicked and trained in person for two years, three years, fail. Big time. At the one point that he really needs them. At the moment, he says, this is what I need you for. Please come with me and do this. And they fall asleep in the process. And he wakes them up, and they fall asleep, and he wakes them up, and they fall asleep. How do you think they felt afterwards? Also, every one of those three denied him. Peter, we see a picture of, but, and ran away once he was arrested. That, think of your worst failure, your greatest sin, and the impact of that on others. None of us have failed that badly. Not any of us. We haven't been given the opportunity, most of us, to do that badly, but we haven't. And these are the ones whom he reinstates later on and who go on to build the church that we have today, along with some others. So anytime you feel unworthy, you are really unworthy to be unworthy because these guys are, are worse than you are. And, and that I am in our worst moments. It says in here,
He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus is overjoyed at times. Jesus is disappointed at times. Jesus is angry at times. But this is the lowest point we ever see him at. At that moment. Overwhelmed with sorrow and to the point of death. And knowing that his disciples, his three favorite disciples, will fail him, ultimately, but even at the moment when he asks this of them, they go to sleep, cannot have been easy. So he goes and prays three times this prayer, and we see the first time he goes there and he knows what's coming. And he asks God, please, please, in this sorrow, in this grief, in this fear, in this everything, can you find another way? There must be, you are the Lord God Almighty, Dad, and you must be able to help me find another way and to do this a different way. Now, we do not hear God's answer. But we see it in Jesus' response. And I don't know if the answer is, you've got to be kidding me, not a chance. Or the answer is no, or the answer is, I am so sorry, but this is the only way. Whatever the tone that it comes at, God clearly refuses the request. God will do that with us. Because he knows more than we know. And he knows more broadly than we know. And he knows what is better for everyone than we do. What we see in the next two times, this, the second prayer is, please, please, but not your will, not my will, but your will. Now, we pray that every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, because that's in there. Thy will be done. We say, no, not my best idea, but yours. And he's saying this, but in the imminence of the torture and the death that he's about to go through. And then the third time, there's a little bit of just want to make sure I hear you right. And there's a resignation in that. And he says, oh, okay, wakes him up. We now need to move forward and head into it. I want you to see not just the fact that where Jesus goes at the lowest point of his entire life is in communication, in communion, in conversation with his father. It's the same place he goes at the high points. It's the same place he goes when he's bewildered and trying to find a way forward. That's the place of answers. That's the place of comfort. That's the place of surety. And what I see here is that Jesus' prayer is an act of trust. He goes to the one place he knows he can get both an honest answer and help. So he goes to his Father, our Father, who art in heaven. It's an acknowledgement of God's power. Jesus wouldn't ask if he didn't know that God could do it. Could God have saved Jesus? Yes, of course he could. He could have taken all the heat off 
and Jesus could have gone on and lived the rest of his life as a great teacher. But because of God's self-constraint, he had to allow Jesus to be sacrificed for the rest of us. Jesus acknowledged God's power, trusted him. It's an act of faith. It's a knowledge of who he was in relationship to God. That's what faith is. Who am I in relationship to you? I need to know myself, and I need to know you. And it's a statement of relationship of all sorts. He was in relationship with God in the asking, and in the answering, and in the accepting. But he was also in relationship with the disciples in their failure, and in their weakness, and in their ignorance, and in their all the things that that entailed. Let me tell you uh, as quick a story as I can tell you because this is, this is probably, this was certainly a turning point in my prayer life and is probably the place that I touch God most closely. I mean, I don't touch him, but I reach out for him and then he touches me. A number of years ago, uh, I felt God, we, we planted a couple of churches in England, and then we felt it was right to move out of England, uh, and God had something else outside there, and so we looked around, and he directed us to, and, and I, I had a choice of five, and this was the bottom of my list. There were five places we could go. The very nice church in New York was on the top of it. It paid good money, it was a good church, and Linda's telling me to keep it going. And we chose the church in Oman, because that's where we felt God led us. And that was the bottom of my list, because they had none of the past four, the pastors that had been four, none of the four pastors before me had made the end of their contract. They were a church known for their quarrelsome nature, and it was an impossible church to manage because it, it contained cultural groups of all sorts. It wasn't a small church, it was about 600 people, uh, but it contained Asians and Middle Easterners and uh, Westerners and the occasional South American and Africans. And they all spoke English is what they had in common, but it, it had different denominations mixed into it and so forth. It was a real hodgepodge and they didn't get on. And I was told beforehand by a number of people, this is a bad idea. And I prayed and prayed and God said to me, I, God said, you can have any of those five. Those five are my choice. You have them because I prepared them. I said, that's amazing. And then I said something that I'm not sure I would recommend to you. But I said to God, what would delight you? And of course, he said, Oman, the bottom of my list, for all the wrong reasons probably. And, um, and he said, I want to offer you to them. And I did not like the sound of that. So I said, yes. Okay, uh, and I surprised myself by doing that because uh, uh, if all of them were uh, okay, I would. So I went there and the church flourished. It was brilliant. We went there and uh, after the first year, it began to just take off. And by the time we left, we had added, we didn't, but God had added more than a thousand people to the numbers. So it had gone from about 600 to about 1,800. We had problems of all sorts. We didn't have enough space. We didn't have enough time. We were running five services on, on a weekend. Uh, it, it, and it, it had, uh, we went from three small groups, which were Bible studies, uh, to 35, I think 36 uh, house groups 
uh, and ministries were proliferating. We had five alphas going at one time, one marriage course going, and this this thing just took off and blew up, and people got healed, and people got taught, well taught, and the staff went up, and and uh, everything was perfect. And the council, which was a mix of about half Western and half Eastern, got terrified. Or at least the Eastern half of it did. And they were afraid because they couldn't control it anymore. And they were afraid that the, the government would get upset with it. The, the Omani government would get upset with it. And they would start throwing people out and, and cut it and they would bring retribution in some form. They didn't know what form, but some form they would be upset. And they were fearful of the government all the time. The Westerners, some of them, but not so much. But the Easterners were always there at the, at the sufferance of the government and wanted to stay below the radar. And this was definitely not below the radar anymore. And so they said, stop this. Stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. Cut out, cut out the newsletter, cut out the bulletins, cut out the communication channels. Uh, we need to, and they started paring back. And after a while, I said no. And they got in a fight with the western side of the council and the eastern side and the western side. And by Christmas time, the... Uh, uh, or in January, I guess, just after Christmas, the um, Western side said, we've had enough of this kind of infighting, and, and there was awful scenes in the council, and they said uh, they resigned en masse. So I was left with seven Eastern people of various nationalities, all of whom wanted to cut everything back, and they ordered me to, and I refused. So we went through this thing, and I walked through the same thing Jesus did. I didn't want to, but they held a trial. Uh, not, not, a, not a secular trial, but uh, a religious trial. Well, they called everybody in the church together to decide what they should do with me. Never had that happen before. I am a lawyer, but, but uh, never had that happen. And then when they called it all together, they weren't happy with what the results were likely to be. So on the day, they bust in Indian laborers who didn't speak English, had no idea what they were doing from a place called uh, Salala. And uh, about two hours away, they brought in three bus loads, so roughly 150 of them. Uh, and they, they just marked their ballots because they got lunch. And they were paid to be there. So they, they had a vote, uh, and they said, fire him. Uh, and it was close, which was gratifying to me, but they, they all agreed with the council, the Eastern Council. So I got fired, then the bishop said, you can't fire him, and then there was conversation with all sorts of people, and eventually we agreed to leave. Uh, but three months later, we left. In the meantime, I couldn't preach or do anything else, I wasn't allowed to, and they moved our house. Now, I walked that path day by day, thing by thing. You would not believe what the stuff that was said, the lies that were told and so forth. And it was the worst thing that I've ever been through in my entire life. And the worst thing about that was because Linda had to go through that with me. And neither of us could do anything about it. And so we didn't make, we joined the crowd that did not make the end of our contract. There was one point in there where I could have turned it all around. And I won't go into the detail, but I had the opportunity, and it was handed to me by the government, who was not pleased with any of this. They were great with the growth, but they were not with the rest of it. And I had the opportunity to fix it. But I had to do something that I did not think God would be pleased about me doing. And the government suggested I do this. And I thought about it and said, that'll fix it. And so I said, go ahead to them. And I could not sleep all night long. And I prayed and prayed and prayed about it and ran in the next morning to the under, Amr, the Under Secretary of the Ministry of Alcohol and Religious Affairs. And I said, take that back. 
He said, I haven't done anything with it yet. I can do that. Why do you want to do that? Because he, he was the one who said, you must do this. Good Middle Eastern solution. And I said, I can't do it in my faith. He said, okay. And that, that resolved it. So every time we get around Easter, uh, because the firing happened the week after Easter, and we walked right up through to the crucifixion, I, I relate to that. But all of us must have something like that. All of us must have a point of failure, a point of being in anguish and suffering that way. Maybe not exactly the same way. And that's when listening to the Father takes over. And sometimes the answer is no. God's will was to give them a choice, and they had a choice of this growth or not. But it, what it takes is releasing people, and they wouldn't do it. After we left, the numbers went down to about 350 in the entire church. The Anglican Church refused to put a priest out there for 11 years from the time we left. And person after person after person express, expressed their regret for what they had done. But the choice was clear. And that's what God had wanted, was to give a choice. And my pain was incidental. The other thing that I learned from that, and I think I can do some extent, is what St. Paul learned from the same thing, because he went through all of that. And his letter to the Philippians, uh, let me just read a little bit of it, and then we'll finish. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say it again. When do we rejoice? It's not easy. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's also sometimes not easy. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious. Thanksgiving and the peace of God. The peace that's referred to there is the shalom peace. It's not an absence of conflict. It's the completeness and the fullness of how God wants you to be. That's peace. That's what that word actually means. It means you receiving the fullness of what God has for you at that moment. We say that at the end of the service. May the peace of God be always with you. That's what prayer leads us to. I know that leaving all of my household goods behind with no money in the bank and getting thrown out of Oman and going back to England with nowhere to go, I thought my reputation, my job prospects were ruined only to be received in all sorts of ways, most magnanimously, and eventually be given probably one of the two or three best jobs in South Carolina when we went next, uh, but offered a number in the UK. God is no man's debtor, and if you stay with his purposes, you have to pray to know them, you have to pray to achieve them, and you have to pray throughout the process. But that peace will be given you. You know who you are in Christ. I can hold my head up because I didn't, not that I haven't at other occasions failed, but I didn't fail at that one moment, which was really the critical one. Why do I want you all to know this? Why is this so important? We have just as a church gone through a process of praying and asking God for vision, and we've been given it. Be unified, be equipped, be missional. 
what it will take for us to do that and what he wants. Let me tell you that without prayer and without God's help and without that relationship in its fullness, we will not be unified. We will not be effectively missional. And we will not be fully equipped. But with it, we will have all of that, all of it, in ways we could not possibly imagine in the most exciting, fundamental of ways. And we will probably most importantly have God's peace. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which is on page five of your service booklets. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You please be seated for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father. <clears throat> You are the creator of all things, the world in which we live, the myriad stars in the heavens, a universe so vast that we cannot compre comprehend its size. And yet you know each of us by name and the number of hairs on our head. We thank you for being with, with us in times of trouble. To know that you are our guide and protector helps us through whatever life may throw at us. We may not always feel near to you in times of difficulty, but your word assures us that you are always at our side and will never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us with an unending and everlasting love, a love that redeems and saves lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Heavenly Father, you are a mighty God and the only one worthy of praise and honour. All creatures on earth and in heaven praise your holy name. We give thanks that we can join this tumult of praise as we lift our hearts and voices to you. May our grateful songs of praise join with the songs of the angels to make a joyful sound of exultation to you. Thank, the, thank you that you listen to our prayers. Open our hearts and minds and help us to take time to sit and listen to what you are saying to us and help us to be comfortable in times of silent contemplation of you and your holy word. Help us to accept the answers to our prayers, especially when the answer is not what we expected or hoped for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, what an encouragement your word is to us. The promise that you will be with us forever, both in this life and the next. We thank you, Jesus, and praise you for the assurance that you intercede on our behalf with our Father God and prepare for us a place to dwell in eternity with the Holy Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, you will bless our Church of Christ the King and equip us to reach out to our local communities to share the blessings that knowing you as our Lord and Saviour brings. We pray this for your worldwide church and in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we ask for your blessings on Igreja Anglicana de Mozambique, Angola. Empower them with your Holy Spirit as the leaders and congregations minister to the countries in which they live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, Heavenly Father, how can we ever really put into words the wonder of how great and awesome God you are? You are a God of creation. Help us to take care of the world you have given us. You are a God who heals the sick and comforts those in need. We give thanks for healing miracles and for all those who work in the medical and caring professions. You are a God of hope and love, a mighty God who humbled himself to live among us here on earth. Help us to spread this message throughout the world so that everyone can live in peace with each other, where no one lives in fear of persecution or hatred and no one is in need for food, water and shelter. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, our prayers for this world and its troubles will be answered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand? Christ is our peace. Our life in him is that peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The shalom of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's share a sign of that with one another.
I don't know what the offertory hymn is. Sue, are you going to announce the home? Oh, okay, yes, we can. Our offertory hymn, 880. 880. Power of your love. short intermission. <laughs> Way too low. Let's try again. Is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross, and he put an end to death by dying for us. He revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim, proclaim 
your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please sit. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and he gave you thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is that mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice, made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice, a praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread and this cup and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and this one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Together, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to, to be here. Thank you, Mike, for your last three weeks and your sermons on prayer. It was lovely. We've really enjoyed it. It's so nice to have you back. So, but 
we'll be sorry to see you go. Um, you're off. I think you're off soon, aren't you? We're not really going anywhere. We'll be gone for a week. And then uh, okay. Right. Anyway, but thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you to the music musicians and everything else. Because up and down like up and down like a fiddler's elbow. <laughs> I was going to say Bride's Nighty, but that would be wrong, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> okay, so on, on Monday, we've got uh, prayers at five o'clock on Zoom. Tuesday and Thursday, we have branch groups, um, in, as usual. And Tavira, Friday, midweek service. I'm guessing that we haven't got an Almond Seal midweek. It's all a bit confusing. Oh, yeah. No. Okay, so... Um, Advance notice, we've got a council meeting coming up on the 16th, which is a two weeks time. So if anyone wants to come, please um, let Jenny know. It's going to be at Janet's house um, at 2.30 on the, on the 16th. And another advance notice is that on the 29th of September, we've got our community service. And I mean, this, this is going to be a biggie. It's, um, this will now be our third yeah, I think, yeah. of doing it. And um, we are hoping to have a, a meal at the Fat Frog afterwards. So this is a note for your diary. Don't book yourself for lunch for that day. So come along and join us at the, at the Fat Frog. And I think that was it. Thank you all very much indeed. Could I just say something? I had a, a message from John Underwood for those of you who remember him, and he asked to be remembered to everybody, and also from Chris Sugden. Oh, so really? I just wanted oh. to tell you. I think we continue with our, and finish with our closing hymn, uh, number 572.
And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in that shalom to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.